jessyblitz.com. I want you to imagine that you've been beaten in a deliberate, deadly attack and that your arm and jaw have been badly broken. And as a feeble young woman, you're paralyzed with the pain and you collapse, only to be savagely stamped upon by two grown men breaking the bones in your hip. Despite the warmth of your blood trickling down your face, you are cold, so cold with fear. And your hope, your hope is as broken as your bones. People would come to visit me as a newborn baby and my mother wouldn't allow them to pick me up. I was the only girl in the family, so I had my brothers to look after and my parents, and I was very respectful. And my father grabbed me and laid me on the table, and he was the first person to rape me. It led to an evening of um, a really violent, violent rape. They placed a chunni on my head at 14 and said that you will get married to Uncle Son. In, our, in my opinion, I didn't matter. I was always told I didn't matter. So I was never received well when I was born. I was told by my judgey that I was left in my pushchair, that people would come to visit me as a newborn baby and my mother wouldn't allow them to pick me up, which is a quite an unusual thing. Um, she said after a couple of days I stopped crying because I knew that nobody was coming from those cries. And I think that followed me through life, really. Um, by the age of six, we'd moved into Leicester from Birmingham and I became the servant of the house. My job was literally to cook for my parents and clean, do all the washing. We didn't have washing machines in those days, so it was all very bathtub and, you know, treading on them and making sure the clothes were clean and dry, the ironing. I was the only girl in the family, so I had my brothers to look after and my parents, and I was very respectful. If I'm being completely honest, I didn't know any different. I was super happy, super... Um, just happy within myself that I was this person just doing what she did. I wasn't allowed to sit and watch television with my siblings so I would collect every book I could from school and I would build towers with the books, I would speak to the books, they were my friends but I just absolutely loved to read. Um, I developed an acute hearing sense because my eyesight was almost taken away from me. My father and mother and most people in my culture don't really like eye contact so we were taught as girls in those days not just myself but other girls around me to keep our heads down wandering around the house and I never actually spoke to my parents or brothers it was all very non-verbal um, I would be given a, um, a duty to do you know wash the dishes or cook they would call me down and I would come scurrying down just to please them. I was a people pleaser. And I remember in childhood, one of my favorite things that they ever got me was a blue crate. Um, because then I was able to turn this crate upside down and stand on it and I suddenly became like a superhero in the kitchen. I could reach everything within minutes rather than really struggling to do the jobs I had to do. This made my job so much quicker and I could do things and be in and out and everyone was happier with me in that way. And that carried on really until I was 14 and then things changed. I was becoming a young woman, I was developing. I was still doing the same jobs as I was. I was working hard at school because I wanted to please my parents. You know, they would never see a grade B, it would always be a grade A. I thought maybe they would like me that bit more, um, but they never really did. It didn't matter whether I had an A star or it didn't matter what I did, they just didn't really want me there and I knew that being a girl in the community meant that you were literally biding your time until marriage. 
So with that, I was happy with whatever I received. So my parents are from North India, from the Punjab. Um, I describe when they came to this country as immigrants, they packed very tightly their cultural beliefs of how women should be treated, how girls should be treated, and how a son is, you know, of uttermost importance. Um, my father was a professional wrestler. He was very well known, very much into his fitness, very loved in the community, a very handsome chap, looks exceptionally young for his age. My mother was a housewife. She did, like most women back in those days, um, had a machine delivered in the house and they would do the overlocking, get it delivered, um, doing the packing, and I would often help with those chores too. But, you know, in, in, in the way that they knew best, they were good parents. You know, I will never hold anything against them in that respect. They did what they knew. So the way that they knew, that that's the way they behaved with us. They weren't very tactile, but I don't think parents of that age were. They weren't very much into giving hugs and cuddles and telling their children that they loved you. It just wasn't the thing back then. My father used to go to the pub, as most dads did. <clears throat> He'd bring back several of his friends. They would come back, and I call them all uncle, because in our culture, you know, we don't say names, we say uncle G to everybody. He came back one evening. I was woken up by my mother. And at this time, I'm just starting my period, so I'm very tired, the hormones are all kicking in. So as a young girl, I'm starting to feel less energetic, and my day would start at five with the cooking and it would end pretty late. So on this occasion, I just wanted to sleep. <laughs> you know, I'm just a teenager. I went and made the food as I normally did, chicken and rice, you know, the standard things that they wanted, the roti. And then I waited on the bottom step. We had a huge wooden staircase and I would sit on the bottom step, normally with my dog, but she was asleep too. And I was playing just with my, my slippers, waiting for them to call me to say, come and pick the dishes up. My father was a, a bit of a clean freak. He always wanted everything to be nice and clean, pristine in its place. So I wasn't able to sleep until they'd finished. And on that occasion, as I went in, I instinctively knew something was wrong. Um, and this is what I say to people, that our bodies, they have this messaging system that is almost spiritual and, and it's an indicator to say, Something's not quite right, but we often ignore the signs. And on this occasion, I, I walked into the room, my head down, heard the voices, they were exceptionally drunk. And my father grabbed me and laid me on the table and he was the first person to rape me. My eyes were wide shut as I described them, but I knew that it was him. I knew each person from their voice, their smell, their even movement from their steps. And um, it led to an evening of um, a really violent, violent rape. I remember waking up in literally a pool of blood on this harsh carpet and the first thing that woke me up was my mum. She opened the door, slammed it, um, and then she opened it again and slammed it. And I was scared. I looked around, my clothes were ripped, I was covered in blood, I had various cuts, and the first thing I thought was, I'm going to get in trouble. And this is something that girls still think nowadays, I'm gonna get in trouble. Because the dishes had been broken, there was dirt on the floor from the food, I didn't give myself a thought. All I thought is that I have to get everything cleaned up before Daddy sees it because I'm going to be in so much trouble if I don't clean this up. And that's what I did. I went into the kitchen half-dressed. Uh, my mum said to me to take my clothes off and I wasn't allowed to shower very often, but she let me shower. As soon as I showered and put on a new set of pyjamas, I'm in agony, I'm in pain. But I go and fill up a bucket of water and I start to scrub the floor, pick up the dishes. And once it's finally clean, I say to her, can I please go to bed? And she just nods um, quite angrily. 
then I go to bed and I don't wake up literally for two days because I'm just physically and mentally so distraught and I, it was the first time in my whole life that I knew something was wrong with my life. Neither of my brothers were married at the time. Um, they were old, they're older than me, so I'm the youngest. Nobody spoke to me. Nobody had anything to do with me. I was forced to go to school after a little while. But even at school, I was very withdrawn. I wasn't really received well at school. I was the only person of colour in the area that we lived in. So I was constantly spat upon. My hair was pulled. I was called a packy. You know, the constant trauma that you get from school, which you accept because it's part and parcel of growing up. But my teachers didn't notice that I was withdrawn. They never asked a question. People say, why didn't social services pick up on it? But for me, that's a little bit of a joke because they should have picked up on a lot more before this had happened. I did get pregnant and I had to tell my mum and I was so scared to tell her. And when I did tell her, of course, I was to blame. You know, I was slapped and punched by her. They arranged for a, a private clinic for me to go to, which was in the West Midlands. I remember that much. And the only thing I remember about the abortion was that there was a lady that came to me at the end of it. I was sitting on some grass in a gown that they give you and she stroked my hair. And that was the first time I'd had some human interaction of kindness. And she stroked my hair and gave me a cup of tea with a biscuit. And I thought, wow, I am so lucky to be getting a cup of tea given to me. I can't be that bad if she's doing this to me. And she touched me. One evening, um, one of the perpetrators came to our house. He'd been speaking to my father on the phone pr uh, previous to that about what we're going to do with her. My father was exceptionally concerned. He kept saying to me, you know, that I've tainted his white turban. He didn't wear a turban, but figuratively speaking, I had brought shame upon him. And for that reason, he was, he was very distraught about what they were going to do, that I had spoiled myself. And I actually just wanted to die. So I took a um, overdose of paracetamols. At that time, they came in a tub. They didn't come in packets. I didn't really know what I was doing. But if anyone's ever tried to do this, they'll know it's an exceptionally painful process because you are in such agony with your internal self that you are neither here or there. And they woke me up when they realized what I'd done punched me, beat me, made me sick, forced fingers down my throat, again leaving me in a state of an inability to wake up and perform. I just couldn't do anything. So I was distraught. I had nothing to live for. It was probably the first time I'd felt true agony, not in the sense of physical agony, but mental agony. I just was ready to leave this world. Um, the solution to that was one of the uncles, as I said, the perpetrators arrived with a junni and some sweets and his wife. And they sat me down in, we always have a front room. If you're Indian, you know there's one room for guests, one room for the rest of you. And I was never allowed in that front room, but it happened in the front room. The front room is where the rape had happened. And I was really triggered walking into that room that night. But I walked in not knowing what was going on. And my father said, aren't you lucky to me? You know, and I thought, do I look up? Do I speak? I don't know what to do. Um, and I just said, hanji, which means yes in, in our language. They placed a chunni on my head at 14 and said that you will get married to uncle's son. I didn't understand what was really going on. Sweets were exchanged. They sat with me and took photos. Looking back at the photos that I do have, I look completely frightened and bewildered by what's actually going on because I don't actually know what's happening because you're not taught as a young child that this is, this is a cultural um, tradition that we're going to carry out. I haven't quite got over what's just happened and I'm entering something new and it was very worrying. Later on, my father told me 
I had spoilt myself and uncle's son has a girlfriend so I'm so lucky that uncle will have me for himself. He told me to bear a child. Um, he told me that I will live there regardless of what happens and he told me that the way I act and behave in this house I will do the same there. He told me he has to give uncle quite a lot of money, quite a lot of gold. He said that it was a trade um, for the silence of what I had done to myself. So I'm turning 15, I'm dreading a wedding, I don't know when it's happening. They tell me it's going to happen at 16 but then they tell me it's not going to happen at 16 because he has a daughter that has to get married first and you know traditionally they have to have their daughter married before you can enter the house. On the wedding day I am a couple of months away from turning 17. I get married after the wedding ceremony at the Gurdwara, which is our temple. I'm sent home. I'm not allowed to be at the party. I am sat in my room and I remember crying because I didn't want to go. A lot of girls cry because they don't want to leave their parents' house. I was crying because I wondered if he too would invite men around and I would be raped again. I had no idea. I wasn't sure what to expect um, and I actually knew he wasn't my uncle in a relative form it's just we called everybody uncle but he I knew him because you know we, we knew each other's families he had an English girlfriend which was really common at the time a lot of Asian boys at that time didn't want to have arranged marriages they had English girlfriends and they were happy within that relationship but they themselves were forced to go into an arranged marriage but Often the girl getting married knew this and she would have to overlook that because it was part and parcel of the culture and the agreement. Um, he wanted nothing to do with me. He had his own room. Everybody had their own rooms upstairs. I was given a very small room downstairs. It was almost like a cupboard. And my job again was just to cook and clean and to provide for them. But the thing was they wanted me to work. They wanted me to go out and find a job. Um, my parents had given them a lot of money but they weren't as well off as my parents were and I think they quite wanted that extra income. So I got a really good job in a large corporation which exposed me to a different kind of culture. Um, people would often say, why are your ankles bleeding? And I would, wouldn't tell them but the truth was that my father-in-law who was abusing me was using a coat hanger and he would tie me up with the coat hanger with my ankles to stop me moving and they would all go off to a wedding and I would have to sit there until they came back. He was afraid I would call for help or I feel sometimes it was a control thing. Little did he know that I wouldn't have moved if he told me to sit in one place because I was so scared. Because girls are brought up with fear, it's the only emotion I ever really knew. Leaving is really difficult because you feel like you're letting your parents down. We're almost born into this cultural belief that we are born for our parents, that what will happen to our parents, what will people say, it becomes a lot about the community. You don't understand that you matter. In, our, in my opinion, I didn't matter. I was always told I didn't matter. So why would I think any different? But people at work were starting to say to me, you know, this isn't normal. And I had romanticised going home, my parents literally opening the door and holding me and, and just pulling me in and giving me that love I really, really needed. I've never held, as I said before, anything against my parents. I didn't know any different and I believe they didn't know any different. They behaved in the way they thought best. And when I did eventually pluck up the courage to go it was because girls were being burnt um, in my community. When I would walk home, I had actually heard a girl screaming because her mother-in-law had set her on fire by pouring petrol over her. And then when the police would arrive, they would say that she committed suicide, but the truth was she wasn't giving them a son and they didn't want girls. So they would get rid of the bride and bring a new bride in who would hopefully give them that boy that they were so deeply wanting. 
I hadn't provided a child, I hadn't had a baby, and I knew that time was coming for me. And it was, I, I just developed a fear of fire, I really did. Um, I didn't have much faith in the police because I would see the police come, the police go, and nothing would be resolved. And in those days where I was married into, it was a terraced house and over the fences, as I would hang out the washing, you could see the other people. And you know, the, the mothers would often joke around with the other mother-in-laws that, you know, a new one's coming from wherever she was coming, we've got rid of the old one, and you couldn't help but hear these things and be worried. So all of that in combination made me decide I had to go. I didn't want to be I didn't want to be forcing my father-in-law off me anymore. It was becoming, it was becoming to a point where I, I, I wanted some respect for myself. I was starting to really dislike who I was. I hated myself at one point, and that's a strong word I rarely use. And when I did arrive at my parents, before I'd got there, they knew. They knew that I had come and left my marital home. I don't know how, but you know that if you are from an Asian community, news travels so quickly that I was on the wrong bus, I wasn't going home, I wasn't going to my in-laws. Someone had seen me traveling back to my parents and my parents hadn't seen me for four years. They hadn't seen me, they didn't come and visit me because as far as they were concerned, when a girl is married, she's not their problem anymore. She belongs to somebody else. So when I arrived at the doorstep, I remember it really clearly. My father, he's just started to shout abuse about shame and people and have I got a boyfriend and why couldn't I just do what I was supposed to do? And I was a prostitute and he grabbed my hair and literally dragged me into the house, into the visitor's room, as I call it, same carpet, and I just knew something was about to happen that I didn't envisage. It wasn't the warm welcome. And I remember speaking because I didn't speak to my father up to this point. I remember saying, Daddy, do you please? I remember begging with him just to allow me to live with them, just to allow me to be there. But he, um, he was very angry, very almost furious. And they just started to beat me. My brother and my father just started to beat me. They um, broke my jaw, then they broke my, um, my arm, um, and they just carried on hitting me. And whilst hitting me, they were calling me names like Ganjari Kutti, which means prostitute and bitch, you know, all of very degrading names. And I'm starting to think that I deserved it because that's what they're doing, and I didn't know any different. And when I fall, I actually fall down because I was quite a thin weight. I wasn't very big at all because I wasn't eating and, and I, you know, I was just a young person. I was 21. They started to stamp on me and as they're stamping on me, I almost feel myself leave the body that I'm in. And I said to myself, what's going to happen now? Because my home nickname's Nimmi. And I actually spoke to myself from ex an external point. I said, Nimmi, this is it. But then I also heard a voice saying, this isn't it. You're not ready to go yet. And something in me just held on. But I stopped feeling their punches, their kicks, their stamping. I stopped. I became numb to it. I just, I was almost focused on just the carpet and the design of the carpet. And I'd almost desensitized to what they were doing and I passed out. When I did come to, um, my other brother was there and he was saying that we can't kill her here, you have to take her to India. And my dad was very, very angry, he was shouting and screaming. But I was coming in and out of consciousness. I couldn't move anything, I couldn't literally not move my body. And I lay there for three or four days before I actually came to and I was still in the same clothes in the same puddle of blood, with the same bl blood had stained and, and dried on my skin. I was in exceptional pain. And I woke up because an auntie came to see me, one of my mum's friends that knew me from birth. And she whispered really quickly that they're going to send you to India in me on Sunday. And she left. I didn't even get to answer. 
I didn't get to even look at her. But I knew that I had to do something. So it was a decision of, do I fight to live or do I just give in? And I didn't want to die. I certainly didn't want to go to India. Um, and the day after that, I didn't hear very much because remember my hearing was exceptional. That's, that's what I relied on most of my life. I tried to get up, I couldn't, I fell. I tried again. And then I managed to get onto my hands and knees. And like a baby, I guess, I felt I was reborn. And I started to crawl. I crawled out of that room and made it to the kitchen. I crawled out of the kitchen into the garden and then there was a huge fence and I thought, I can't do this, my dog's found me, you know, she's quiet but she's found me. It's almost, I think animals often know when somebody's hurt or in pain or sad. But she was just looking at me if I'm being honest. And I somehow stood up and got over this fence and I hid across the road where there was a tiny little park and I passed out in the bushes there. In between passing out, I could see my father driving up and down the road looking for me. But before I knew it, I woke up and it was probably early hours of the morning. The world, as I call it, was asleep and I made it to a taxi rank. So I um, had made friends at work. Um, there was a couple, um, the chap was Nigerian and the girl, she was actually Indian as well. And, and I really kind of trusted her because she was somebody like me, I guess. They said that if you ever get into trouble, come and stay with us. And that's what I did. I did go to the police. I did stay in the hospital because I had to stay there f for a couple of weeks because I had extensive injuries. Um, I stayed in a hostel and I couldn't deal with that. People there were suffering from their own traumas and they were um, relying on drugs and alcohol, which I wasn't used to, so I found it very scary. I went to my friend and they'd actually split up, but my friend who was Nigerian said, you can stay here. We didn't have a relationship, we were friends, but we did go out one evening and I got drunk. I drank Malibu and I've never drank that ever before. I never drank it again either. Um, but in my drunken state, he did take advantage of me and I became pregnant. I decided to keep the baby and I'd asked him to make home with me because I didn't know any different. It was a huge taboo being with somebody who's black because in my culture we don't have that. But I saw him almost as a saviour because he'd given me somewhere to live. And I didn't understand how I was supposed to be treated. So for the first time someone had said, you can stay here, albeit pay me rent. But for me, that was a huge thing. Um, and I didn't spot the signs. And to cut a long story short, we did have a very long relationship for 23 years, whereby I have three amazing children and I wouldn't change it because I wouldn't be without those children. But I suffered from domestic violence. I suffered from a loss of identity because I hadn't found myself and suddenly I was taught, told to be something else that I wasn't. I was told, I was constantly told I was fat and unattractive. Um, it was a control thing, but it was all to do with money. And if anyone's ever been in an abusive relationship, they understand that there are different types of abuse and mine was of a very high level of abuse. Um, the police described it as, as a very dangerous type of abuse to have lived through. My pillow was set on fire whilst I was sleeping and the reason was given that I wanted to end it all. Um, he used to lock us in our bedrooms at night at 11 o'clock and reopen the locks at, at um, 5 o'clock in the morning and that was again a control thing. He was afraid we would leave. He knew that he was treating myself very badly, but I had nowhere to go. I had no family. As far as I was concerned, I'd made my bed and I was going to lay in it. And culturally, I'd been taught that you stay with whoever you have children with. So I tried to give him everything I never had. And incidentally, the Nigerian culture is very similar to the Indian culture where it's all about family but he was actually um, not part of his family. He had left his family because he studied in the UK in boarding, in a boarding school. So he didn't really have the same values I had hoped. Initially, I thought he did, um, but I never fell in love with him, but I didn't know what love was. Um, and that carried on until 
I was removed by social services because an attempt was made upon both my son and my life where he filled the house up with gas and it was just an explosion waiting to happen. In fact, it was my daughter that saved our lives because he'd sent her a message admitting what he'd done. Um, she had noticed that things were very wrong because when you leave a situation, you become suddenly aware that that situation is wrong. And with being at university, she tried to warn me so many times that he would kill me, but I never believed it. I always thought he was warning me with the things that he did. Um, he would bang my head against the wall just for the fun of it, because he could. He would drive me to places and leave me there just because he could. You know, I allowed him to do those things because I felt I wasn't worth anything more. And having had fear instilled in me as a young child, I didn't feel that I deserved any better. I didn't know any better and I was just after all a girl. So I had no self-worth. Um, that led to homelessness because when you own your own business or you have property in your own name, the help only goes so far. So I did find myself homeless with my youngest son and actually somebody from the school who's a very religious lady, I call her my angel, took us in and said, let me help you, let me stay, you can stay in my house. Being not very trusting, I was very cautious but Again, I felt maybe this was a message from God to say that he'd sent me somebody to help me in that time of need. I did it more so for my son because he was really struggling. Um, at the same time, the police had come to find me because my father had been arrested. I thought they had come to find me because of my partner, but they had come to find me because my father had been arrested because he had abducted a six-year-old sister that I had that I didn't know about. He had had her with a Polish lady, so to hide this shame, this whole um, illegitimate child, he got the, um, the lady drunk and abducted her and took her from country to country within Europe until he ended up in India where he left her uh, in a school in the north of India. The police told me they were charging him with abduction but they needed to know my relationship with him and I explained how I had been beaten in an honour killing but without sufficient proof or witnesses I couldn't do anything um, as they said. So they took the character reference from me and they proceeded with the charges and he was released from prison last year and he was received very warmly by the community for the act he had done because they believe he'd acted in a very honourable way to retain that honour within his family. He now wears a turban. He has been in the business of public bars, pubs. He's been running them for a long time, um, but now he has other people running them for him. Um, and now he lives again with my mother because he wasn't living with her on and off. He was sort of living away. Oh, I've changed hugely. Um, I understand the importance of standing up, speaking out, um, not being silent. I understand the importance, not for myself. It's never been about me. It's about the people that are out there that need that message, that need to resonate with my voice, my experiences, to say to them that I found freedom. And freedom for me doesn't mean going out and the way it's described in the Asian community of being able to cut your hair or to go wild in, in the way they portray it. It's just simple things like not wandering around in your own home in fear, to be able to live with the dignity of basic human rights, to have that ability to love yourself and extend that love to others.